Hello and welcome to the uh, PASTESH video lecture series. I'm Justin Davis, I'm a cardiologist uh, from Imperial College London. This is the first of three lectures uh, which will take you through some of the important aspects of uh, cardiology which may all come up in the MRCP part one examination. The first lecture we're focusing, the, focusing in on chest pain and looking at causes, diagnosis and treatment. The basis of this lecture is there is a question which I'll give you an opportunity to uh, go through each of the multiple choice stems uh, and then we'll explain the answers and look at some uh, accompanying slides. So question one. 45 year old man presents with previously diagnosed di type 2 diabetes uh, to accident emergency department with severe central pain, nausea and sweating. He has several risk factors and the question goes on to ask what's the most appropriate intervention following this presentation. I'll give you one moment to think about that. If you elected for D, percutaneous coronary intervention, you'd be right. This man is presenting with uh, clear symptoms of an acute myocardial infarction. He clearly has risk factors for coronary artery disease, including being a smoker, having diabetes, and hypertension. There is good evidence now to support uh, primary uh, PCI or primary percutaneous coronary intervention as the gold standard for treatment of uh, this uh, presentation. Whereas previously we may have elected for thrombolysis with either a uh, TPA type drug such as alteplase or a streptokinase drug, now we know that primary PCI is the best option and will uh, render patients with less uh, symptomatic uh, problems of heart failure in the long run and also has an improvement in survival from the acute episode. Of course this stem here also tests your knowledge of uh, prioritisation because um, these are all uh, drugs which you may use uh, in and around uh, management of an acute event. For instance if someone presents with an acute coronary syndrome you may administer low molecular weight heparin and uh, if someone presents uh, in the cath lab and we need to go on to do intervention, we may well give a drug such as abciximab, which is a glycoprotein 2B3A receptor inhibitor. So clearly this um, test, the question tests the management of this condition, but it also illustrates the importance of, of risk factors in uh, being the cause of the underlying uh, coronary artery disease. We know that blood pressure is a very, very important risk factor uh, in uh, determining arterial disease uh, and both can predispose to stroke and uh, congestive cardiac disease as well. In this slide here, on the left you see um, the relationship between blood pressure and stroke. The bottom left you can see a normal blood pressure around 123 over 76 millimeters of mercury rising steadily to blood pressure 175 over 100. You can see the almost 16 fold increase in stroke with this rise of blood pressure, clearly showing how important good blood pressure control is as a cardiovascular risk factor preventing stroke. You can see a very similar relationship on the, the slide on the right hand side to coronary heart disease, you can see where as blood pressure rises you have a marked increase in the risk of uh, developing uh, coronary heart disease. Blood pressure of course does not just predispose you to uh, developing uh, coronary artery disease but it also predisposes the, to the development of uh, renal disease and in this slide here you can see that in both Caucasians and the African American population of a very, very large study, as blood pressure rises, there's a marked increase in both the Caucasian and the African Caribbean population of renal failure. Interesting to note that in every single blood pressure range, even starting from the very lowest range, around less than 117 millimeters of mercury, the African Caribbean population has a far higher incidence of renal failure when compared to the Caucasian population. This, of course, may reflect other social uh, or economic factors which we know also impact renal failure. Other well-known risk factors which came up in the question of course you'll be familiar with your, your practice yourself uh, are the effects of uh, cholesterol both on coronary heart disease and cardiovascular death. Here once again we can see um, the as cholesterol rises here from four millimoles per litre going up to six the relative risk increases markedly from 0.5 to about four. This is both for coronary heart disease and also for cardiovascular death. 
clearly uh, indicating to us this is, a, again, a very, very important uh, risk factor to control uh, in terms of prevention of uh, arterial disease, uh, which can lead to coronary disease, stroke, and, of course, death. Diabetes, a growing epidemic, uh, which certainly uh, is now spreading from the developed world to the developing world, and certainly is a problem which will uh, impact greatly on the burden of arterial disease we see in our practice in our lifetime. This is a marked cardiovascular risk factor for both coronary artery disease and uh, for stroke as well. And uh, certainly we should always pay very close attention to ensuring that we have the best, blood, uh, best diabetic control we can uh, achieve. We can see that uh, diabetes uh, predisposes to uh, a whole range of uh, different uh, diseases, ranging from stroke, coronary heart disease, congestive cardiac failure, uh, and indeed all cause uh, mortality. Uh, and one can clearly see a marked difference uh, in this study between the non-diabetic group across all these disease spectrums and the diabetic group. So once again, illustrating the importance of diabetes as a cardiovascular risk factor. Smoking. Smoking we've known about since the 40s as being important for lung cancer and more recently important for arterial disease. And certainly this is a, 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 a major risk factor which we should uh, try and control and limit uh, at all costs as it will predispose once again to the development of arterial disease. Now we've spoken about these all in isolation but almost certainly from a population level, from your patient's level, what's more important is how these all add up together to uh, predispose to the development of uh, disease. And here you can see in this Venn diagram we have smoking giving a 1.6 uh, increased chance of developing disease. Uh, elevated cholesterol, a four times increased chance, and uh, having blood pressure of more than 195, a three times increase. We can see when these are all added together, and if a patient indeed had all of these risk factors, it would summate to about 16-fold increase in developing arterial disease, which clearly is, is a markedly elevated risk and uh, clearly puts the patient in a very, very difficult, different risk group than they would otherwise be if they didn't have these diseases. Now I'm going to move on to question two. Question two is a 52-year-old man is undergoing an exercise tolerance test for coronary artery disease uh, screening after suffering indigestion-type pain whilst playing squash with a workmate. A very common presentation to clinic. He reaches stage two of the BRICE protocol when his blood pressure is 210 over 100, his heart rate is 170. Some ECG changes are noted. Which of the following is the strongest indicator for stopping the test? If you went for C, you are correct. A two millimeter um, ST depression in the lateral leads. Certainly exercise tolerance testing currently makes up the lion's, lion's share of uh, non-invasive screening for uh, coronary artery disease. Several, there are several absolute factors which mean we should stop exercise testing. We're gonna cover those briefly. Looking through these alone here, a blood pressure of 210 um, is just about tolerable. Certainly anything over that would consider stopping. Uh, and indeed, patients who develop a very hypertensive response during exercise tolerance testing uh, is a predisposition for hypertension in the basal state. Heart rate, we wouldn't stop unless the heart rate became particularly elevated as a result of an arrhythmia. That may be ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, for example. Otherwise, we're, of course, looking to induce a tachycardia to really stress the heart. We try... If and, and avoid stopping at the patient's request unless that's absolutely necessary and we try and encourage all our patients to push themselves as hard as possible because clearly the validity of the test is at stake. If people stop when they've only achieved a very low workload, we know that the uh, reliability of the test is low, whereas if they've achieved over 85% of their target heart rate, we know that the validity of the test is, is far greater. And lastly, ventricular ectopics. Well, ventricular ectopics, of course, can be seen on a, on a resting ECG. They can also occur during exercise testing. There is some evidence from a single study which shows that subjects who have a lot of ventricular ectopics in recovery of exercise testing uh, is related to coronary artery disease. But clearly, in this uh, slide here, we can see that the, the, the clear differentiator, the one which points out that this patient is likely to require further investigation, is the fact that they develop ST depression uh, uh, during exercise. Now, one of the 
key points which candidates always uh, fall down on is they try and assess uh, both in the exam and uh, clinically uh, the ST segment immediately after the QRS complex. And this is incorrect and the college will frequently test, upon, test on this. When assessing an ST segment, it's important to look 80 milliseconds after the end of the QRS complex. The reason for this is if we induced uh, a tachycardia in anyone, it takes time for the, uh, the electrical activity to get back and above the isoelectric line. If we measure too early during a fast tachycardia, it'll make it look as though everyone has upsloping ST depression, which is clearly incorrect. In this slide here, you can see I've illustrated the J point and to assess the ST segment, we need to measure 80 milliseconds or two small squares after that. We now move on to contraindications to exercise tolerance testing. So the first on the list here would clearly be subjects who are unable to exercise, and these may be patients who are wheelchair bound or subjects who feel they're unable to get up sufficiently high level to achieve a diagnostically useful exercise tolerance test. The next would be those in whom the ECG is ininterpretable. And these may include subjects with left ventricular hypertrophy and a strain pattern. And just remember, the strain pattern looks like T wave, T -wave inversion uh, on your ECG. Of course, one of the diagnostic features we look for in, uh, in induced ischemia. Uh, subjects on digoxin, where they also have uh, U waves, which again look like an ischemic ECG. Subjects in whom the, the QRS complex is abnormally widened. So these may include subjects with left bundle branch block, Wolf Parkinson White, or those who are paced. In these group, it's very, very difficult to ascertain anything about the ST segment, uh, and this can leave us to uh, really relying basically on uh, our, our diagnostic criteria falling down to symptoms alone and paying very little attention to the ECGs themselves. Next, we move on to the group uh, of people in whom it's dangerous to exercise. These include subjects with acute coronary syndrome, those with severe hypertension, including blood pressure more than 210 millimetres of mercury, subjects with moderate or severe aortic stenosis or hokum, subjects with left ventricular failure, and those with an inflammatory type condition such as myocarditis, and clearly subjects who have got an active dissection. Now, in certain specialist set settings, uh, we will exercise people who have aortic stenosis or hokum, and the reason we do this is to try and look for a gradient under exercise. So positive exercise tests, these, these features include having classical angina pectoralis, ST depression of more than 1.5 millimetres at 80 milliseconds after the J point. So remember this J point has got to be 80 milliseconds after that. Developing an arrhythmia, this may be they develop ventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, all of which can be induced by ischemia. Developing ST elevation, clearly that's a worrying sign and will be uh, put out of alarm bells that this is a positive test. Blood pressure not rising by 15 millimetres of mercury. So normally during exercise test, or when we exercise, the total peripheral resistance falls, meaning that your diastolic pressure falls, and as a result your heart works harder, increasing your systolic pressure, leading to a wider pulse pressure. If we don't see that increase in pressure, that could well be a sign that there's underlying ischemia and would again alert the clinician that some, something may be subtly abnormal with the exercise test. On the right-hand side of, here, of our slide here, you see the equivocal group. And then these are subjects who we often are presented with clinically. Typically, these may include people who have less than one millimetre of ST segment depression, people who are unable to do a proper test, and those who present with very unusual atypical chest pains. False positive exercise tolerance tests include young females, subjects who hyperventilate, subjects with syndrome X, subjects who are anemic, so if they have a very low haemoglobin, even in the presence of normal unobstructed coronary arteries, they can often have a positive exercise test, and those with left or right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Contraindication to thrombolysis will include surgery or major trauma, having a head injury less than two weeks preceding the episode requiring thrombolysis, active bleeding less than 10 days before, intracranial tumour or previous subarachnoid haemorrhage, recent stroke of less than a year, blood pressure of more than 210 over uh, 100 millimetres of mercury, bleeding abnormalities, being pregnant whereby uh, they have a huge vascularisation of the placenta and administering thrombolysis is clearly a, a very bad thing and can cause major haemorrhage. And then uh, conditions such as dissection 
uh, or pericarditis or a non uh, S elevation infarct. Relative contraindications, which requires clinical judgment, uh, include those with hemorrhagic uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy and hemorrhagic stroke. Now, clearly, uh, this list uh, is, is a list which we apply to patients having thrombolysis. And I suspect in coming years, we'll be referring to lists such as this much less as we provide primary PCI to more and more people. We'll now look at the mainstream modalities for uh, uh, investigating chest pain. These include exercise uh, testing, which we've spoken about, dobutamine stress echocardiography, Valium, CT calcium scoring, CT angiography, and coronary angiography. Now clearly, as we work down this list, tests become more invasive uh, and uh, also require the administrations of various chemicals or nuclear radiotides or indeed uh, a dose of radiation to, to image the patient properly. By far and away, the, the, the most frequent test performed on this list currently is an exercise tolerance test, as we've spoken about. But nice guidelines are currently working their way through, which will, will mean that the first line investigations will, is likely to become a CT calcium scoring in the not too distant future. Here we see uh, an illustration of a, a coronary angiogram on the left side of your screen, and you can see there's a white arrow which clearly illustrates a narrowing in the circumflex artery. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see two different non invasive in imaging modalities. On the top, right is an echo base image where we have contrast uh, perfusing through the myocardium and you can see where the white arrows point a blackened area or grey black area where the contrast is not perfusing properly and this is the region of the uh, narrowing in the circumflex artery and then in the same patient they've also undergone a thallium investigation and you can again see the nice yellow colouring throughout most of the ventricle and there's an area which is pointed out by the white arrows which is, appears not to be perfused by the thallium. So these non-invasive tests would be done, of course, first and point to the uh, fact that there's a problem with one of the arteries which needs attention at angioplasty. Spoken briefly about uh, um, CT calcium scoring I th and the NICE guidelines is going to push this into the mainstream agenda for us. Uh, and uh, above and beyond that, it's possible to do CT coronary angiography. This is where we use a small bolus of contrast into a peripheral vein and take a very rapid sequence of images of the contracting heart uh, to image the coronary arteries. On this slide here, you can see uh, that this subject has a severe left anterior descending uh, stenosis distally, and you can see I've labelled all the other arteries. We now move on to question three. 30 year old man presents with three hours of central crushing chest pain. He admits to regular cocaine use. Including, including the evening that he presented to the emergency department. He once again has a whole host of risk factors and is hypertensive. Which of the following is the most appropriate man, a way to manage this gentleman? If you went for percutaneous coronary intervention, you were correct. This gentleman has, has clear evidence of uh, ST elevation which is suggestive of a myocardial infarction. Given he also has symptoms, we need to treat this as though it's an acute myocardial infarction, and we need to have a look at these arteries in the catheter lab. Cocaine is clearly very, very bad for arteries uh, in a number of ways. It causes spasm to coronary arteries, which independently of the development of atheroma can cause chest pain, ST elevation, or ST depression. And it causes, and through me mechanisms of increasing blood pressure, uh, it can lead to uh, the, the premature development of atheroma, which can, of course, then lead on to the development of a coronary artery disease and uh, thrombus formation and presentation, as in this question, with an acute myocardial infarction. We would treat this patient coming into A&E in exactly the same way as we would treat another patient, but perhaps have some caution with administering some of the drugs which we know uh, are, are essential part of the treatment algorithm, uh, the long-term uh, maintenance of someone with established coronary artery disease. And particularly, I'd like to pay attention to administration of beta blockers, as in this group, beta blockers can worsen coronary spasm and can make symptoms worse. This is a question which frequently comes up in the college examinations. So just to summarize, the treatment options of acute myocardial infarction include percutaneous primary coronary intervention, which we've spoken about, thrombolysis, 
coronary artery bypass grafting, and this may well be an option if a patient comes in, they have imaging uh, of their coronary arteries, and they have such severe disease uh, that we're unable to offer an angioplasty, or it may be that during angioplasty, technical dif difficulties arise, which mean that the patient then needs to go on to have an emergency bypass operation. This happens rarely, but it is an important treatment mentality not to forget. And then the bottom group is a conservative management. And these may be old people who come in with only a very small artery affected, of which um, performing angioplasty is futile because the stents are likely to occlude, or in someone who's extremely high risk or otherwise in very compromised and unable to undergo a, a procedure or thrombolysis. The group is very similar for those who present with an acute coronary syndrome. So these are, are typically people with non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions with positive troponins and, and good coronary symptoms. And the treatment here would include percutaneous coronary intervention, so looking at their arteries, imaging them, and opening up vessels where appropriate. Again, coronary artery bypass grafting for severe disease uh, in, in three vessels, usually in subjects who often have diabetes, where the vessels are very uh, small and not very amenable to angioplasty. And of course, we have medical therapy, so this may well be subjects who repeatedly come in uh, with very difficult uh, to treat disease, or in subjects who are very, very elderly or not amenable to either bypass surgery or coronary intervention. So question four. 67-year-old man is referred to the cardiology clinic with angina and episodes of syncope. Has a history of hypertension managed with ramipril and indapamide and suffered an inferior myocardial infarction some four years ago. On examination, his blood pressure is 125 or 105. He has a soft ejection systolic murmur, loudest at the apex. He has some evidence of heart failure. And you're asked which of the following is likely to be the most significant problem uh, driving his symptoms. If you answered C, aortic stenosis, you're right. Clearly, this gentleman presents uh, with symptoms which may all be suggestive of either ischemia, which could be reduced by an arrhythmia, by coronary artery disease, or indeed a valvular abnormality such as aortic stenosis. What would alert me particularly to this being aortic stenosis is clearly his murmur, so he has a systolic murmur, and the fact that he has both angina and episodes of syncope. And I'd want to rule this out uh, prior to any other investigations. Clearly, if this is aortic stenosis, it's likely to be causing him some uh, difficulty because he looks like he's now going on to develop uh, signs of decompensation. So with any valvular abnormality, or indeed with any arrhythmia, one of the main reasons that subjects get uh, angina-type symptoms in the presence of normal coronary arteries is uh, the normal homeostatic regulation of coronary blood flow becomes disrupted. Coronary arteries, unlike normal systemic arteries, get most of their blood flow during diastole and not during systole. So circumstances which arise to alter this delicate balance can leave people uh, with an inadequate supply for, uh, uh, to their myocardium and result in angina or dyspnea. Typical scenarios may include mitral stenosis, whereby there's left, left, less left ventricular filling and often accompanied by a high ventricular rate, which means that the diastolic time period is shortened. So this is why often in mitral stenosis we'll administer beta blockers to slow down the rate, allow more time for filling and prolongate the uh, diastolic period, allowing better coronary perfusion. And indeed in this scenario here with aortic stenosis, where the perfusion pressures which are normally delicately balanced between that in the myocardium and that in the aorta become disrupted. In aortic stenosis, the left ventricular pressures are very, very high, and the aortic pressures can become very, very low. So the normal driving gradient down the coronary artery becomes lost, and this can lead people, even in the presence of unobstructed coronary arteries, to develop symptoms of chest pain uh, and uh, uh, dyspnea. We'll now do the next question, question five. A 50-year-old man with long-standing hypertension presents acutely with severe central pain radiating through to his back. He looks unwell with a resting tachycardia of 110 and a blood pressure of 150 over 96. There are no murmurs, a neurological examination is normal. An urgent CT scan of his chest confirms a type A dissection. The local cardiothoracic centre is contacted and urgent transfer arranged. 
he's received appropriate analgesia, but how do you manage his blood pressure? If you answered B, libitalol, you're right. One of the most important things you can do in the treatment of acute dissection is to ensure that blood pressure is well controlled. Ideally, you want an agent with a short half-life which works quickly and its effect can be regulated dynamically and also one which, can, can, which reduces the cardiac contractility. Clearly on the list here, libitalol is your first-line drug. Although it's not the only drug which we can use and indeed in some circumstances you may use nitroprusside. I would avoid using agents such as amlodipine or enalapril orally as their effect will be a very long lasting and may be disadvantageous if the patient's blood pressure was to fall precipitously and of course they will take some time to become effective in the patient, maybe taking an hour or two before they start to lower blood pressure. There are two broad classifications of dissections which you should know about, DeBakey and Stanford. The DeBakey classification is divided into type 1, type 2 and type 3 as you can see illustrated here. A DeBakey type 1 on the left hand side of your uh, diagram involves an area extending from the aortic root all the way down to the iliac arteries. A type 2 in the middle just involves the aortic root. Stanford lumps these two together as a type A. As a rule of thumb, anything involving the aortic root carries with it a much higher mortality and a worse prognosis. And this is the group who we want to act on usually very quickly and of often need operative intervention. In contrast, a DeBakey type 3 or a Stanford type B usually involves other parts of the artery, aorta, not the aortic root. This is frequently managed more conservatively, often with blood pressure lowering and then semi-elective surgery in the next day or the day after that. Depending on the precise nature of a dissection, can present with different symptoms. So dissection forwards can present with rupture, neurological abnormalities, or loss of pulses, whereas a dissection which ruptures backwards can present with valvular abnormalities such as aortic regurgitation, tamponade, or myocardial infarction. Dis dissection is frequently uh, precipitated by elevated blood pressure, which of course, as we've spoken about earlier, could be itself uh, elevated as a result of administration of drugs such as uh, cocaine. Congenital abnormalities such as coarctation will clearly elevate blood pressure and again predispose to it, uh, as can conditions uh, such as a connective tissue conditions such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Zandos syndrome. We must also consider the increased risk of dissection in pregnancy and of course the effects of uh, trauma. Final question is uh, question six. In which of the following scenario have statins not been shown to be a benefit? If you answered C, you'd be correct. We spoke about earlier in, this, in the lecture about the importance of cholesterol and elevation of cholesterol as a risk factor for coronary artery disease and stroke. Most of the research which has been carried out is in secondary prevention, usually after myocardial infarction. And there's good evidence there that administration of statins is highly effective at, the, uh, at reducing the uh, proliferation of further coronary artery disease and preventing further uh, myocardial infarctions. There's much less evidence, however, for the administration of statins as a primary prevention uh, drug. Trials underway at the moment, uh, looking at this in much greater detail, and there may be a, a, a case in the future whereby we treat people uh, with mildly elevated cholesterols if we can confer a good enough benefit for reduction of uh, myocardial infarction and uh, coronary artery disease. So just to summarise, the secondary prevention of uh, coronary artery disease would be having good blood pressure control, so less than 130 millimetres of mercury in a non-diabetic subject and 120 millimetres of mercury as our target in a diabetic subject, having a cholesterol of less than 4, having very good sugar control, smoking cessation and weight loss. We've spoken about some of the important factors in uh, precipitating chest pain, but there are certain other factors which we must bear in mind which can 
exacerbate symptoms. These include arrhythmias, whether they be slow or fast rhythms, so tachyobradial arrhythmias, patient who's profoundly anemic with a low hemoglobin, subjects with intercurrent disease, so patients who may well have minor coronary artery disease who become very septic and become very hypotensive. Patients who are hypoxic, maybe at altitude, with mild coronary artery disease may well develop symptoms. And clearly those who have had trauma, both to the thoracic cavity and uh, a contusion to the coronary arteries or the myocardium itself. That concludes the first of these past test cardiology videos. Uh, I hope you can join me for the second lecture where we're going to be looking at cardiac electrics and also some physiology.